I posted a photo of Andrew Basiago, who in 1972 went back to see Abraham Lincoln give the Gettysburg Address, and the response was terrible. Almost everyone who gave it a thumbs gave it a thumbs down, as if to say this didn't happen. Andrew Basiago is an attorney today, practices in the state of Washington. Articulate, cogent, and credible. Not incredible. He is credible. I'm going to read you an article. I did a search. Here is the search I did. Basiago and Gettysburg were the only two words I used. 6,000 web pages. The second link on the Google Advanced Search. Top line, meaning each word must appear on the page. The second link, executive producer dot posterus dot com posted november thirteenth two thousand ten this is the article i'm reading let's get started andrew basiago talks about lincoln at gettysburg there's a photo of lincoln andrew d basiago has emerged with evidence that secret u s time travel technologies were used as early as nineteen seventy one to acquire first-hand documentary knowledge about September 11, 2001, fully three decades before the horrific events of that fateful day. Mr. Basiago, a child participant in DARPA's time travel program, Project Pegasus, has publicly stated how in 1971 he viewed moving images of the attack on the Twin Towers on September 11, 2001, that had been obtained from the future and brought back to the early 1970s. DARPA is the chief research and development arm of the U.S. military. The Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA, created the precursor to the Internet, ARPANET, and has a penchant for trumpeting its advances such as putting surveillance cameras on the backs of bumblebees and other exotic achievements in military science. Mr. Basiago claims that DARPA's secret technical accomplishments go far beyond what it has publicly acknowledged, and that by 1970 DARPA had achieved teleportation-based time travel, as well as advanced electro-optical means of discerning past and future events via different technologies that provide quantum access. Mr. Basiago has described how, while serving in Project Pegasus, he viewed moving images of 9-11 at the secured U.S. Defense Technical Facility where they were processed after being retrieved from the future, the Aerojet Corporation facility that once stood at the corner of Bullock Avenue and Leroy Place in Socorro, New Mexico. According to Mr. Basiago's whistleblowing testimony, Donald H. Rumsfeld, the sitting U.S. Secretary of Defense on September 11, 2001, was the defense attaché to Project Pegasus during the early 1970s when Rumsfeld was officially serving as a counselor to President Nixon and member of his Board of Wage and Price Stabilization. In all likelihood, Mr. Rumsfeld, as the defense attaché to Project Pegasus, would have known about and possibly had control over the data about 9-11, derived via quantum access and brought back to the early 70s for analysis by the DARPA Research and Development Program under his administrative authority. Mr. Basiago's eyewitness account that Secretary Rumsfeld and others knew about 9-11 decades in advance because data about it was gathered via DARPA's secret time travel program unlocks several of the more enigmatic facts in the 9-11 literature and may be the key to society's unraveling of the ultimate accountability for the false flag operation that took place on September 11, 2001. We will explore Mr. Basiago's whistleblower eyewitness evidence regarding how secret U.S. government time travel technologies relate to 9-11 in future installments of this series. Corroborative Evidence of Andrew Basiago's Secret U.S. Government Time Travel Corroborative Documentary Evidence of the Veracity of Mr. Basiago's Time Travel Expeditions on behalf of the U.S. Government exists. This documentary evidence consists of a photograph 
of Mr. Basiago taken at the scene of the U.S. President Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address on November 19, 1863, after he was teleported to that location in the time-space continuum via DARPA time travel technology. And then there is an audio recording, Coast to Coast AM, November 11, 2010, Hour 3. Now, George Nury is talking to Andrew Basiago about Gettysburg, and I want to play that for you because it's interesting. Thank you for listening. Here's the recording. You're there as a spectral presence in that time and place, but not there entirely physically. And that's what Chronovision was achieving and a later technology called plasma confinement, which they were using to, to get me to Gettysburg in 1863. And let's talk about Gettysburg. We've got this incredible photograph that you gave us. It's up there on the coasttocoastam.com website. Explain that and why Gettysburg. Why'd they send you back there? Actually, it took place in the spring of 1972. I was taken to a time lab in East Hanover, New Jersey, under the direction of Dr. Sterling Colgate. Dr. Colgate was then serving as the president of New Mexico Tech, the New Mexico School of Science and Technology. He had developed a methodology called plasma confinement where the time traveler stands in a chamber, a clear lucite chamber, and walks into a cloud of plasma and is essentially wormholed to a past location. In fact, that was the only time that I was involved in actual wormholing, where as I was moving through the quantum plenum, uh, I was moving through a, a, a series of, of arching tunnels that were sort of chaotic as I moved on to my destination. The reason that I was invited to go there was essentially as, as a reward for performing so well in the project. My father and Dr. Colgate asked me whether I wanted to go see Abraham Lincoln give the Gettysburg Address. They thought it was going to be a great, a great thrill for me to do that. But in fact, I was thinking back to my history education uh, in the program and also my conventional schooling uh, and, and, and imagining that 1863 portrait of Abraham Lincoln by Alexander Gardner, where he looks basically like, like, like a chimpanzee in a black suit. And I was terrified by the notion of seeing Abraham Lincoln as he might appear <laughs> during his life. It was sort of a Boo Radley moment uh, in my childhood to even contemplate. So I actually begged off, and, and Dr. Colgate said, well, Ray, uh, to my father, well, Ray, let's uh, come back in two weeks and ask Andy whether he wants to go. So my dad drove me up again, uh, up Ridgedale Avenue, up, up to the, uh, the Time Lab in East Hanover, and they asked me the same question. And really, to please my dad, I said, sure, let, uh, I'd like to go and, and go see the Gettysburg Address. So uh, a woman named Valerie, I remember her first name, dressed me as a Union Bugle Boy, and I was invited to enter the plasma confinement chamber. Actually, before that, my dad took a pen, and, uh, or pencil, rather, and he had a kind of a mimeograph of an 1863 map of Gettysburg. And he showed me that there was a north-south arterial through the heart of Gettysburg that in the northwest branched off uh, on another road. And they were going to put me down via plasma confinement right on the side of that road so that I could ask a passerby which way Gettysburg was and then walk straight into town into the very sort of minimal downtown that then existed where Lincoln was going to be giving the Gettysburg Address on a dais about three feet off the ground yeah. right in front of the cemetery there. So I walked into the, inside the chamber, I walked into the uh, cloud of, of plasma under confinement, and I had this hellacious journey to Gettysburg where actually my hat was ripped off, both of my shoes, and one of my socks. Oh. And I popped into view next to that road northwest of Gettysburg. I could smell ozone. I was feverish. I was then reacting to the rather brisk autumn air, and I realized I only had one sock on. Uh, so my training took over, and I sat down, and I pulled off the other sock and threw it into the bushes, because I figured if I'm going to be walking into Gettysburg barefoot, I, I should be entirely barefoot. So I then began walking without a hat. I didn't have a jacket. I was just dressed in the, uh, the jersey of a Union bugle boy. No shoes. I met a, a gaunt teenage soldier, a Union soldier, walking along the side of the road, and I yelled to him, as my father had instructed me, Hey, friend, which way Gettysburg? And just this like individual that, yeah. stopped and squared his shoulders in the direction I was going and pointed that way. You're going in the right direction. So I spent about, I would say, 20 minutes walking past farmhouses and really utterly shivering in, in the cold uh, autumn air. And I got into downtown Gettysburg, and I thought, I better find some, some warmer clothing here because I'm not going to be able to stand seeing Abraham Lincoln give the Gettysburg Address. And how long are you supposed to be there? I beg your pardon? How long are you supposed to be there before they yank you back? I was expecting to be there only long enough to see the Gettysburg Address. And the paradox of this, it really shows how advanced their time travel technologies were by this time. We're talking 1972. 
in some of these probes, certainly the chronovisor probes, I'm not certain about plasma confinement, they were actually able to see us where we were located in the quantum hologram. So I was anticipating there being there for several hours, but really just long enough to see the Gettysburg Address. So I, I walked down to downtown Gettysburg, and I went up on some of the wooden sidewalks that were in front of the downtown Gettysburg a, a storefront. So Andy, there you are. You're, you're little, you're shoeless, you're almost coatless, you're freezing, <laughs> and you're walking into Gettysburg to see President Lincoln's address. What happens? Well, I walked into downtown Gettysburg, which really didn't even resemble a downtown area. It was just really a cluster of, of buildings that looked like housing with some of them, with, with multiple sh uh, stores occupying some of them. And I walked up onto the wooden sidewalk of one of them and looked into what we would call a millinery shop, which during the Civil War contained things like men's shoes and hats and cravats and walking sticks and so forth, gloves. And as I was doing so, an elderly man gambled on up to the wooden sidewalk. He was about 70 years old, and he was limping severely on one of his legs. And he began yelling at me, boy, boy, what are you doing out here in, in the cold like this? You're going to catch your grip, which I take in the Civil War must have meant catch a cold or, or a flu. And I've identified that man from, a, from historical photographs as a Gettysburg cobbler named John Lawrence Burns. Huh. John Burns um, was a citizen of Gettysburg. In fact, he was one of the first volunteers to the War of 1812 as, as, a, as a child. And when the Battle of Gettysburg swept through and past Gettysburg in July of 1863, he volunteered as a Union sharpshooter, was wounded in the hip, and was surrendered by Confederate forces under a flag of surrender back to, to the Union uh, forces and, and was discharged from the battlefield. And so when I identified this man uh, from, his, from historical photographs and, and realized it was the man who then took me inside the millinery shop to outfit me with a jacket and shoes because he was concerned about my well-being, I, I really found three things that were quite his startling historical correspondences. One, of course, was his appearance. The other was his injury. I mean, before I even knew and had identified him as John Burns, I was describing how this 70-year-old man was limping severely as he walked up onto the wooden sidewalk. Mm -hmm. And then the other linkage that uh, quite serendipitously identified without initially knowing who he was, was his profession. He was a Gettysburg cobbler. So he took me in the shop, and we went, we went to the back of the main floor of the store. It just was a, basically had a kind of a storage room behind that one-room one uh, floor space. And there was a shelf with multiple shelves that had used shoes on them. They weren't military boots. They were civilian shoes. And he took a pair of brown men's street shoes that must have been about a size 14. And he had me step into them, and he began actually shoving packing paper into the front of the shoes and was giving me this pair of, of, of secondhand shoes. He then took me into the storage room behind the uh, uh, shop and rummaged through a stack of about 40 men's jackets, most of them military issue and outfitted me with a navy blue Union winter parka, which fit perfectly. And then as he was sort of smiling at me, he put a cap on my head. He then said, young man, uh, I have to go. The President of the United States is arriving here today, and I have to see him. So he, he, <laughs> actually, he actually walked out of the shop limping severely ahead of me, and I followed him over to the dais where Lincoln was going to be soon arriving, uh, walking along like like a, a young boy, uh, you know, in his father's Sunday slippers. Like I could hardly even walk in these grossly oversized men's shoes. Now, over at the dais, which at that point only had maybe 10 or 15 people uh, had already gathered, there was a, 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 an open dais with nothing on top of it. It was just a big wooden area, about, let's say, 20, I'd say maybe 15 or 20 feet deep and maybe 40 feet across with patriotic red, white, and blue bunting around it, but no parapet or, or ceiling of any kind or pillars or anything. It was just a, a flat a, a expanse of wood. And I went to the front of the dais because I'd, I'd been told that I was going to be given the opportunity to see Lincoln give the Gettysburg Address. And I was trying to overcome my fear of, of looking at him when he arrived. And I looked to my left, and there was my father dressed as a Pennsylvania farmer. So he and, went back there too? Well, he went back there, but he had left East Hanover on a previous day, but had been sent to the same day in history, November 19th of 1863. Was he looking for you? 